This is the Game Changers Experience. Deep dive conversations with leading business disruptors, Olympic athletes, celebrities, entrepreneurs, and influencers from around the world. This show will teach you insights about the winning principles in mindset, productivity, marketing, branding, entrepreneurship, business strategy, and more. Hosted by Productivity Authority, business strategist, former elite athlete, author, and public speaker, Adam Strong. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Game Changers Experience with myself, Adam Strong. And today we have an an amazing guest, which was introduced to me, and uh, his name is Andy Paul. Now, Andy is a two times bestselling author. He's ranked the number eight LinkedIn list of top 50 global sales experts and, and consulted with some of the biggest, largest companies in the world. And uh, such as Square and Philips and Grab, Grab Hug and many more. <coughs> and he's also got uh, a hit podcast or had a hit podcast called Accelerate Your Sales Podcast. Uh, which was acquired by Ring DNA in 2020 and has since renamed it uh, Sales Enablement with Andy Paul. And uh, I'm looking forward to today's conversations because some of the things that we're going to be talking about is not just about sales, but we're going to be talking a little bit about psychology. We're going to be talking a little bit about neuroscience, which is very in vogue of today. Uh, We're going to be talking (laughs) about some of the questions that you guys need to be asking on your offline and online um, conversa- conversations, how you can increase your conversions, and how do you deal with those awkward conversations or knowing when to ask the right questions at the right time. So without further ado, Andy, welcome to the show. Adam, thank you very much for having me. Very cool. So l- listen, I, I know that um, I'd like, I like to, I always like to get uh, our, our guests to kind of um, give us a little bit of a backstory, I suppose, in because I remember hmm. reading your bio on LinkedIn, it was really interesting. And I remember, I think it was on LinkedIn or your website, and it said something about um, when you went for a sales job or whatever it is, they told you that you were you just weren't salesy enough in order to get the position or whatever <laughs> it is. <laughs> and and when we think of the word salesy, it's like oh. And I'm sure that there have been many experiences for some of our li- for a lot of our listeners. And we think of the word sales, they've had a bad experience, and generally right. that's what it that's what it normally boils down to, doesn't it? But please tell tell us a little bit more. Sure. Well, actually, that's that's a part of a story I tell in my my latest book, Sell Without Selling Out. And yeah, it's just uh, when I got back from my first I, I of college, I went to work for this really big big tech company at the time and second largest computer company in the world at that time. And that these very formal structured training programs that we went to as new hires. And at the end of the two week training course, the instructor sent back an evaluation to my boss, basically saying, yeah, get rid of this guy. Never gonna make it in sales. He's too analytical. It's, you know, ask too many questions, blah, blah, blah. It's just sort of wasn't the stereotypical extroverted, uh, sales personality. And yeah, at that moment, I said, well, geez, I either need a way to figure this out or I'm going to have a very short career. So did you always want it to go in sales just out of curiosity? No, okay. no, it was sort of a, like many people, you know, sort of a fallback, <laughs> fallback position with no real plan when I graduated from university about what I was going to do. And Sort of kicked around for a couple of months after I graduated. And then the expectation was from my parents and myself, I guess, as well, that I should get a job. <laughs> and uh, a lot of the big tech companies were on campus recruiting. And so, yeah, I just sort of seemed to be what people wanted. And so I went out and interviewed a bunch for it. Interesting. I mean, I mean, you've gone sort of, le- you've gone leaps and bounds now. You know, you've turned your, what your so-called weakness was, which was way back then, into kind of a strength now, which is really interesting. How how mm. was it? How was that? I mean, I know that's been over a space of 20, 25 years or so, or more. <laughs> oh, quite, um, quite a bit, quite a bit longer, but yes, yes. <laughs> by the way, just for just for the audience, that he's still 21, just to let you know. Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, but tell us a little bit more how um, how you kind of pivoted. Well, I wouldn't say pivoted, but reinvented yourself to turn turn yourself into 
kind of the so-called sales expert, one of the world's leading posi positioning authorities in sales. And what was the kind of lead up to the journey? Was it through corporate corporates and kind of the conventional job sort of route or was it going straight into running your own business? I don't know. It was, it was yeah, 25 years of, of working for other companies. But yeah, I wasn't really pivoting. I mean, it was really staying true to myself. That was you know, really the thing that that was, you know, my path and that I write about in my book is that if there are 5 million salespeople in the world, there are 5 million different ways to sell. And it's really the job of, of leadership within sales, within companies, help develop you know, people to become the best version of themselves. And so I was fortunate early in my career to work with managers who, yeah, gave me enough rope and leeway to go out and experiment and try different things because I wasn't the conventional salesperson type, sales personality type, and try different things and find out what worked for me. And that really just set me on this path of saying, okay, it's, I'm always going to be more successful if I think I'm selling in a way that's aligned with who I am, my character, my values, and so on. And that's what I've done throughout my entire career. It's what I you know, urge people to do and, and all the content that I produce is it's, it's not complying to somebody else, somebody else's vision of what a salesperson is, but who you are and what your unique strengths are as a human being. And how do you amplify those to be able to help you help your buyers? Yep. Love it. Very cool. Now I want to get straight into the deep end here because I, I know we've, we're going to be going into some very, some very thought provoking, I suppose, questions and exercises, which I'd love to talk to you a little bit about, but Let's go straight into some of the sales aspects of not just some of the things that you've written in your book or, or books, hyphen, um, mm. but also I wanted to talk, I want to go straight into some of what we, you've identified in your latest book, which was called The Four Selling Pillars. Um, what are they and how can they be applied for running your own business, if you may? Sure. Well, so yeah, my book, Sell Without Selling Out, does I define sort of two primary modes of operation people fall into us uh, when they're selling, whether it's a salesperson or your business owner or, or what have you, and you're, you're marketing your products, which is one is selling out, which is the stereotypical sales behavior that you described earlier so accurately is that people resist, instinctively resist. <laughs> uh, that's, yeah, that's selling out. That's putting your own interest ahead of those of the buyer. The opposite of that, that I describe in detail in the book is, is called selling in. And it's based on four innate human characteristics we all possess, which is connection, curiosity, understanding, and generosity. Meaning is that we're wired to want to connect with other people. And through this connection and through this rapport we build with people, is that's, that opens the door to us building trust with somebody. And trust becomes so important because as we move through a process with the potential buyer of our product, we need to have permission to ask them certain questions that they wouldn't normally answer, right? Absent trust, you might get some superficial answers, but you want to earn the right to really stick your nose into your buyer's business. Because if you do that, then you'll develop a better understanding of the things that are most important to them and the ways that you can help them achieve those, which is really your goal as a seller. My goal as a seller is not to persuade you to buy my product. It's to listen to you and understand the things that truly are most important to you in terms of the challenges you face and the outcomes you want to achieve by addressing those challenges. And then I want to help you get that. And so helping you get that is being generous, right? If I give myself to help you achieve something important to you, selling done well is the ultimate act of generosity. So it's really these four innate human behaviors that form the basis for successful selling, successful relationships in multiple dimensions, uh, successful collaborations. Very cool. Now, where does, where does the belief come in into this four-step pillar? Would that come before connection? Where would that come in, Andy? Belief in yourself? Yeah. Well, I think that, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it is part of, part of your makeup, right? I mean, confidence is important. Belief is important. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's sort of addressed in a couple of areas in the book. One is in this pillar of curiosity is you can't, can't be afraid to ask questions. Mm. So one of the things that holds many people back in life in general and sales in particular is they're afraid to ask questions because they're afraid it'll be exposed what they don't know, 
right? That the nature of the question will illuminate somehow that, oh, you misunderstand something or you just don't understand something. And people don't want to be put in that position oftentimes. So you need to have the confidence to be able to ask questions, right? You don't need to know everything in advance. That's part of the reason you're there is to ask questions and, and to learn. Yeah. But if you're selling something to somebody is, is if you're truly and sincerely interested in them, then your questions will be welcome. You know, even as I was a rookie salesperson and knew nothing about anything, business, computers. I had CEOs of companies willingly spend a fair amount of time with me to answer my questions. It was, that was basically my, my business degree I was getting uh, my first couple of years in sales. But it's because I was sincere in the questions I was asking. You know, I was there to learn. I wasn't uh, being gratuitous. I wasn't being self-interested. And when you're in that environment, people will give you time. Interesting. Yeah, really interesting. I love that. Very cool. Now, one thing that fascinates me more than anything else, which I, I feel is probably one of those subjects which I feel probably isn't spoken about enough, which is understanding the psychology of the buyer itself, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, I mean, yes, we could talk about neuroscience, we could talk about dealing with people's objections, but actually it's much more than that, isn't it? Do you feel, um, how, we, I mean, from your perspective, how can we, how can we as business owners and entrepreneurs, how can we get a better mm -hmm. understanding of the psychology of our buyers? What do you recommend and, and where do we seek? Well, I think that, yeah, you have to read widely in any event, right? As, a, as an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, business owner is, is people used to ask me when I was at a stage of my career, I was doing a lot of small business consulting. They'd say, well, how'd you choose your clients? And I said, well, I'd go into the CEO's office and I would look at how big of a stack of books did they have on their desk? <laughs> and those that had a big stack of books, I knew we were going to get along very well and be able to do well together. Those that weren't didn't have a big uh, stack of books therefore probably weren't very curious yeah that wasn't gonna be a client for me mm -hmm. so this ability to keep reading widely is important you know when you talk about psychology of buyers i mean there's been so much work done behavioral economics and social psychology and so on it's an interesting field because the goalposts move constantly as we continue to learn more about um the human brain and how people think and and so on is yeah it's there are no givens oftentimes i mean one example is for years this idea of loss aversion uh was you know it's hugely important it's you know one of the tenets of, of behavioral psychology and decision making was that you know people more readily you know invest avoid a loss than than getting a, achieve a gain but you know new research came out you know just in the last couple of years saying ah, maybe not so much maybe that's a fallacy and okay great but you may find through your own experience that maybe your customers deal one way or another maybe they are a little more loss averse you know because nothing is 100 percent. and so all these things you read about oh if you know about reciprocity and influence and so on that you know these tests social psychologists do you know, yeah, they're not saying that 100% of people act this way. They're saying, oh, we did a study and 60% of people predictably acted in a certain way in, in response to a particular similar stimulus. Well, keep that in mind. It's not 100%. You're going to come across people that, that aren't necessarily that way. But it's really important, I think, to ground yourself in as much of that as you can, because it's not just all about you. There's you know, selling and buying as a two-way street. So, yeah, I like reading books about that. Behavioral economics, uh, social psychology, economics, just to sort of give me some insight into what people are thinking. Yeah, that's cool. Very good. Um, interestingly enough, over the last couple of years, has been quite interesting for a lot of companies. Um, mm. And uh, I, you know, I, I mean, because you've been in sales for 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 quite forever, years, yeah. forever and ever. And um, how do you feel? sales has changed over the last couple of years especially as we were as we're kind of moving more into what we call the digital revolution now and how people's uh maybe people's behaviors and and the way the touch points work and things like that how do you feel 
um, sales has changed over the last couple of years and how can we adapt to kind of the new ways of working in terms of digital uh, digital ways? Well, I think you sort of need to separate sort of the process from the act of buying itself because I think the humans as a species, we haven't changed in the last two years. Uh, you know, we haven't evolved <laughs> that quickly. The way we gather information and process information and, and use that to make decisions is still the same. The mechanisms have changed, right? The way we communicate with people have changed. But the way that we, as I write about my book, the way we connect with people, the way we, we influence other people's, that's still the same. So at one level, it hasn't changed at all. But the way you get there has changed, right? Is is sure, we're not as in person as often as we were before. So we need to perhaps for many sellers doing things more, more things virtually than they did previously. All right. Well, that has that has an impact somewhat in terms of, you know, you're not in a room with someone, so you can't interpret the body language the same, let's say, as you know, do our remotely. So certain accommodations you have to make and certain ways you have to sort of think a little more clearly and slowly, perhaps, than you did before. You're not rushed to assumptions. But uh, I think people sort of do themselves a disservice, say, well, everything's changed. No, the ways which you and I are going to communicate that, you know, the, the media we use, that's changed. Right. But if you're the buyer, you really haven't changed. So the same basics exist, which is at the end of the day, and there's been, you know, multiple research studies on this when buyers make decisions, whether this is, you know, a consumer purchase or it's a, a business to business purchase, is a majority of the factors taken into account in the decision making have to do with the experience with the salesperson or the experience with the seller. Mm -hmm. And, and so, yeah, if anything, you have to, I think that's becoming more important as more automation comes into the buying and selling. The part that's left that is the human to human part of it actually becomes more important. So the ability to, to uh, really bring your a game every time you interact with the buyer really becomes more important. So there's no, <laughs> there's no unimportant sales touches these days. Do you, do, you, uh, do you think that, especially over the years, I mean, I know there's been some research out there that says um, the average amount of touch points, or I would say average touch points that happens between, um, you know, coming in contact with someone for the first time to the end of the sale or, or the, when the sale actually commences, if you like, or when they make a decision, was around mm -hmm. six times, maybe 10 years ago. Do you feel that that has increased over the years? And I know there's been sort of wildly, um, some wild figures out there. Some of them are saying 12 touch points. Some of them are saying 10 touch points. What is a touch point and what defines? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, I, yeah. I just wanted to put it out there's, there. because Yeah, there's no real clear cut answer. So there's been a lot of studies done about how many times do you have to reach out to a new prospect before you actually talk to them for the first time? So that's one set of studies and numbers. And that says, depending on what you believe, yeah, it's pretty wide range, 12 to 20, meaning phone calls, email attempts, message attempts, whether you're you know, using text, is to try to reach somebody before you get them to speak with you for the first time. Yeah, it's, that sounds about right. I mean, it's not, not unusual. That could be the case. Um, during the sales process itself, once you've somebody engaged in their interest and saying, yeah, we're in this process together, I would say there's probably more interactions or attempted interactions between sellers and buyers just because compared to 15, 20 years ago, because there's so many more ways to, to contact people, right? You know, sure. Email and messaging and so on. And I think sellers uh, actually lean into that too much probably because there's a lot of gratuitous outreach attempts. And again, there's another issue I write about in the book is, is you have to understand is that when you're trying to reach a buyer, what you're asking them to do is invest time in you. And when people make an investment, what do they want? They want a return on that time. So if you're doing a lot of just sort of, hey, just checking in to see what's happening you know, with your type, type outreach to customers and touch points, you're wasting their time, right? You're just, <laughs> what value are they getting from that? Right. So you have to be very intentional these days. And so I think 
perhaps in some cases, resist the temptation to, to outreach to a buyer, to, and to, to message them. And the basic standard is, hey, if as a result of interacting with me, the buyer is not closer to making the decision after that interaction than they were before, then it had no value for them. Yeah. It's pretty simple. So you, and you as a seller can anticipate exactly, exactly what they'll be in advance is based on your intent. What's my intent? What does the buyer need from me right now in order to move, make progress toward making a decision? What do I need to do to make that happen? Well, that has to be your thought in mind as a, you know, if you're the frontline salesperson or if you're the CEO who's doing selling or whatever, what in this interaction is going to help the buyer move closer to making a decision? If you don't know the answer to that, don't do it. Right. And right. it's really hard for sellers. What do you mean? I'm not supposed to reach out and it's like, yeah. Don't don't consume their time unless they're going to earn a return on that time. I suppose I don't know. Maybe it's maybe people feel like they feel the need to, or they feel pressured. I don't know. It could be, or I don't know. Whatever whatever the scenario or reason might be. Well, sales sales hates a vacuum, so salespeople <laughs> hate hate a, val- hate a vacuum. So in the absence of information and and stimuli, mm. they want to go out and create some, and. Yeah, unless you're, there's a level of intention behind it that says, yeah, this this outreach, this contact point, this sales touch, I like to call it, this sales touch is going to help the buyer make progress toward making a decision. If it's not going to, don't do it. Yep, love it. Very cool. Interestingly enough, this actually beautifully moves into because I picked up some uh, some great golden nuggets from what you said there, and I know that when we're having a sales conversation, whether it be face to face, online, whichever it might be. And for whatever reason, you know, I, I believe sales is also about timing. You know, some people are not ready to make a decision or they might mm-hmm. not be ready to move, move forwards, right? And you can go, can go with that. But if someone is in a position where they're not quite there yet, they're not quite over the line, but they, but maybe a business owner or a business leader had them in the back of their mind and they want to what's the word I'm looking for? Reignite a conversation, should we say, you know, whether Mm -hmm. it be three months ago, six months ago, whatever it might be. How should one approach reigniting that conversation? What should we say in that conversation? And how long should we leave it for? (laughs) (laughs) Million dollar question, isn't it, Andy? Yeah, I mean, there's no, there's no one answer to any of those questions. But I think that that if you've been talking with someone and they said, look, timing's just not right. Okay. I mean, we're maybe three to six months away. Contact me again at that point. I mean, that's, that's one thing to start is when you have that last conversation is you reach agreement on when you should reach out to them. And then you might also say, look, yeah, in the meantime, would you mind if I continue to send you information that might be relevant to this you know, potential change you're looking at making? And it's very easy these days with you know, email tools is to set a little sequence up to drip information uh, to the potential buyer and to keep them informed. You just have to make sure that, again, the same lesson as before is that it's going to be worth their time, right, to, to read whatever you send. So if you're just putting them on a standard email drip campaign from your marketing department and it's all, yeah, sell, sell, sell type content, yeah, that's not going to be useful. But if it's content that again, relates to the decision they have to make, then sure, do it. And, and just like I said, just make sure it's, it's good. Because, yeah, as we know, we're competing for tiny slices of the buyer's attention with thousands of other sources of information. They're going to devote their time to those sources of information. They're going to get a return on investment. I mean, there's actually a study that was done this by uh, Herbert Simon, Nobel Prize winning economist back, uh, I think, in the early 70s even before the internet, and he was forecasting this time, he said, when we were going to be inundated, he was basically forecasting the internet, before it existed, he said, we're going to be inundated with uh, all these sources of information contending for a slice of our attention. And how do we as human beings make that decision? And what he found through his research was, ah, we make an economic decision. Did I get a return on my investment of time? And if I did, then I'll continue to devote more of my time to that you know, source of information. So you want to be that for the sellers to say, yeah, it's worthwhile every time you interact with them. There's something in it for them. Very cool. Very good. Um, 
I know that um, in your in your latest book, Sell Without Sin, mm. um, you mentioned um, within the book there are some key questions that you outline, and I call them key questions because they're key questions that we should ask. Um, you know, pro- we call them prospects for the time being because they haven't bought. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. What are some of the key questions that you would recommend um, when you're having a sales conversation, whether it be face to face or online or sure. whatever the scenario? But what would be some of the really, um, you know, whether it be um, just thought provoking or anything that kind of adds within the the, the four pillars that you outlined and, and hits the mm-hmm. mark on? Sure. Well, yeah. Under, in the chapter on the curiosity pillars, I, I have six types of questions that I lay out and that you can use and the goal is that there are types of questions right what you want to do is is take your existing questions and use these as guidelines to sort of reformat and refashion yep but just to give you a couple examples and one that type of question i really love is i call it an impact question which is you're asking the buyer to basically quantify the impact of making a change or not making a change so it's a way of asking a question again is going to cause the buyer to stop and think. So, you know, you might say, look, as a seller, you might want to pitch this idea that you have this capability called X, Y, Z, and, you know, we can do X, Y, Z. Well, you could say that, or what you could ask instead is, uh, interesting. So what would the impact be on your, let's say your revenue? What would the impact be on your revenue if you could do X, Y, Z? So you just take that sort of simple question, statement of fact that you would have made before, you turn it into a question and you're asking people to quantify what the impact would be. And you might say, well, what would the impact be on your company? Oh, great. okay, interesting. Well, so tell me, what, what would the impact be on your team if you could make do X, Y, Z? And then you take it down to the final, you just layer it. Organization, team, person. What would the impact be for you personally? If you could do X, Y, Z, what would that mean for your day-to-day job or what would that mean? And so when you throw in this word, what would the impact be? And you can associate with a, you know, with a descriptor that's revenue or bottom line, top line, whatever is you know, relevant to the buyer. And they have to sort of think about that, right? And when they start thinking about it, then it starts this idea of making a change starts becoming a little more real to them. And it's just a great way to, or start a conversation and at various points of conversation keep people thinking in very real terms about what the impact of a change is so that's one example very simple people to use and you can take your existing questions like i said and sort of reformulate them as i mentioned using the impact you know another type of question that's that's a great conversation starter is what i call an insight question where you're going to ask a buyer something about their business prospects something about their business that they might really reasonably expect to know but probably don't and what you do is you're going to get this from talking to your existing customers that are using your products or services and you're going to find out where they're really extracting the value from using your product and service and a lot of times it's it's not intuitively obvious if you spend any amount of time going back and talking to your customers after they've used your service or used your product you'll find that actually they, their use case may be quite unique, maybe different than what you sold for them. Um, so you aggregate those insights you get from your buyers, and then you can turn those into questions for customers. Um, you know, in my case, when I was a consultant, you know, I'm always focused on sales effectiveness. And so I would ask a CEO very typically, so, so tell me, is, is, so how many selling hours does it take to move a prospect from initial point of contact to close? Right. Not days, not weeks. Tell me how many selling hours it takes. They don't know. I've never had a single CEO answer that question. They should know. <laughs> Absolutely should know. But what it does, so that type of question is that the person you're asking goes, oh, well, what am I missing? Why don't I know that? Why is this important? Right? Tell me more about that. Let's talk about it. So it's a conversation trigger for sure. That's cool. I love that. So I'm very good. To, uh... I always find, you know, it's interesting because I suppose asking intelligent questions, thought-provoking questions that gets, as you mentioned, gets the buyer to think, gets them to really get them to gain perspective, right, of their position. And I suppose it helps them to 
it, it kind of persuades themselves that actually, do you know what? I'm realizing that I've got a big problem and maybe you can help me, right? Well, yeah, to some degree, sure. Is what you're doing is you're having people visualize, right? When you ask an impact question, you're visualizing, for asking them to visualize what the impact of that change is in really concrete terms. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's a problem that so many sellers have is this speak in generalities. Well, generalities don't help buyers make decisions. Specifics do. So if I'm asking what the impact on your revenue would be if you could make you know, XYZ change, you're going to have to think about that. Well, he said, oh, maybe yeah, it'll be a 5% growth. Great. Well, let's talk about that. You know, this 5%, is that significant for you? Is that worth the investment? We're going to start digging into that. What would the business case be to make this, you know, pay off for you? Mm. Just opens the door to a lot further, deeper discussion. Yep. Love it. Very good. Now, interestingly enough, um, I know mm. that quite a few, there's, there's, there's listeners uh, in on the podcast that have developed online businesses because that is very much in vogue on vogue and i suppose you, you've sure. also got a uh, digital nomad being able to work wherever they want whatever they want wherever they want in the world which is kind of cool mm -hmm. um in terms of being able to like in sweden for instance exactly there you go <laughs> or if or in my case sometimes i'll be in cyprus or i'll be in the uk or whatever yeah. it might be um so <laughs> but i'd love to know more about um what do you recommend in from a from a I don't know if it would be uh, questions as such, but what would you recommend in terms of the sales process with regards to building relationships when someone has maybe opted in, say, to a ebook or a lead magnet or whatever it is, and nurturing that relationship over time? What do you recommend for some of our listeners from a sales automation perspective? Because again, I suppose you've heard of the concept of people hate to hate to be sold to, but they love to buy. And so I'd love to know mm -hmm. more about kind of your thoughts behind the whole kind of, you know, online touch points and the automation side of stuff. What are some of the things that we need to put within that automation, potentially depending on what the customer journey looks like? Well, I would, I would sort of start at the beginning and sort of rethink the assumption that, that, you know, it's going to be an automated type type outreach. I mean, I think that that the great platform for people to form connections and have conversations is LinkedIn. Yep. Full stop. Agreed. And so if you're a salesperson, if you're a business owner, is you have to really look at and say, okay, what what's my strategy? Excuse me, what's my strategy for connecting with my target audience on LinkedIn mm -hmm. and influencing them to some degree about what I do. And that starts with being a creator on LinkedIn, being a content creator, posting on a consistent basis, building your audience, building your brand on LinkedIn, your personal brand. Uh, or sometimes you can even companies have successfully built their corporate brands on LinkedIn. Um, it's, this is how you do it. I mean, it's, this is a much more effective way as uh, I don't know if you know, Tim Hughes, a UK based expert on social selling. Um, and he was saying, hey, you, know, you have to imagine us, you know, what if he, he said, what if I told you I was going to come to your house every day and pick you up and drive you to a place where there are hundreds of thousands of your customers. Uh, and all you had to do is have conversations. Wouldn't that be interesting to you? And it's like, of course it'd be, right? Well, that's what LinkedIn <laughs> is. So there's this temptation to say, yeah, we just, you know, we need to have this automated, you know, our marketing stack and, and our sales stack. And there's certainly things in there that are important. But first and foremost, think about what's your strategy on LinkedIn to reach out and connect, start having conversations with your buyers. So your ICP is, is putting out content that uh, brings you to their attention, that causes them to reach out and want to engage with you. Um, yeah, LinkedIn is the place to, to do that. So that's really should be the focus. And there's yeah numerous resources to available online. I mentioned Tim Hughes wrote a great book on social selling and others that can, you know, start walking you through that. Love it. And, and it's I, a place to have real human conversations. I know that you're pretty active on LinkedIn. I know we connected yes. on LinkedIn recently. And, and I, I mean, how many, just out of curiosity, how often are you on LinkedIn, just out of curiosity? 
better question is when am I not on LinkedIn? So <laughs> no, I, I post once or twice a day on LinkedIn, um, which is about what you should be doing if you're building your audience. You know, we've sort of been consistently at this for about seven years now, building the audience. We're up close to 200,000 followers. Uh, we have fairly engaged following, but there are some people do it much better even than I do. Um, and that's, it's really, I think, a core proficiency. I think if you're an individual salesperson listening to this, th this is how you connect with your buyers. You know, this is where you're going to find your buyers. This is, this is uh, a place to be yourself, bring yourself to the game. We know from studies that, that 82% of buyers look at a seller's LinkedIn profile before they speak with them for the first time. That's high enough. You just assume it's hundred percent, right? So when they <laughs> go, when they go to your, when they go to your profile, what are they seeing? Ooh. Right? Who are you? Yep. What do you care about? What do you talk about? What do you write about? What do you, what do you like? What do you not like? Um, you know, who are you following? What are you commenting on? This, these are all, you know, it is a human business we're in and, and people want to know who they're dealing with. And if I go to somebody's LinkedIn profile and they've contacted me and I'm looking at who they are and they've got, 600 followers and they never post original content. It's like, eh, I'm not even sure it's, you know, to me, that's almost smacks to a fake account. Though I know, you know, the vast, vast majority of people on LinkedIn, that's exactly what their profiles look like. You know, it's 1% uh, of people on LinkedIn of the 500 million or however 600 million they're on it. Yeah, I think the stats roughly break down the 1% are creators, 9% uh, sort of engage with the content and 90% are just lurkers. Very well, nice. Break out of the break out of the mold. Don't be a lurker. Yep. Be somebody that stands out because ultimately, buyers make decisions to purchase. As I said before, based on their experience with you, dealing with you as the human seller, mm -hmm. and amplify that experience. And LinkedIn's a great way to do that. Do you um, do you post on weekends as well? By the way, on occasion, mm -hmm. um, okay. but it's, I, I I tend to create a lot of content ahead of time, and then we we schedule some of it. So it gets, uh, there are tools you can use that, that post stuff automatically. Mm. Uh, and so we, we use some of that because, you know, I sort of work on a, a process where I create sort of create in, in bulk, let's say, and then uh, every, yeah, every week, basically, you know, I devote part of a, actually I do it on weekends. I, part of a weekend, I, I write my LinkedIn content for the coming week. And then I'll do some more spontaneous posting what's happening or something I've seen, but yeah, sort of once, once, twice a day. And, and there's a real pattern to the type of content you produce. Uh, you know, you want to vary it up and uh, there's an art to writing for LinkedIn. So that's another reason people need to get engaged is, is you need to find out an experiment, just like in sales, when you're talking to somebody face to face. And I talked about early in my career, I went out and experimented a lot to see you know, how I could connect with people. I could engage their interest. How could I make myself interesting to them? to get them to agree to invest their time in me, you do the same on LinkedIn. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah, if you're posting and no one's engaging with it, then yeah, you, there's lots of courses you can take, teach you how to write more effectively on LinkedIn. Invest a hundred bucks, 200 bucks, take one. Um, and then track, you know, is our people paying attention to what you're writing? You know, I think that's one of the things that I love about you is the fact that you, that you're not afraid of experimentation. And I feel like a lot of people, they're just, they give up too easily. Do you know what I mean, Andy? It's like, oh, no one's mm. reading my post. No one's engaging with me. No one's, you know, and, and so people are so, I feel like some people are so, um, they go after vanity metrics rather than kind of the, the real engagement, the real kind of meat on the bone. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, but you're going to, if you're going to invest the time mm. to, to post stuff on LinkedIn, then, invest the time to do it right so that it gets exposed to people that want to read it and and you start engaging conversations with so lead to you know more people wanting to hear what you have to say and and hopefully you know, some of those are our clients it's like just don't do something because you're supposed to do it do it and do it well and yeah. i'm always uh amazed because i'm you know as you've mentioned before i've have a podcast of my own close to 1100 episodes i interview a lot of authors and and creators on the show as well and yeah, someone want to come on the show and it's like, they've written a book and I'll go on Amazon and they've got six reviews 
It's, it's like, well, why, why are you doing that? If you only want to get six reviews, don't, if you go to the effort of writing something, don't you want people to see it? I mean, that's, that's sort of, I think what <laughs> separates it sort of vanity. I think if you're just posting it out there and you don't care whether anybody reads it or not, to me, that seems vain. Uh, if you think you have something to share, then yeah, go to, go to the effort to affect the craft that comes with creating that content or craft of engaging with people and getting, get people to see what you've done. If you've made this contribution to the world, don't you want people to see it? Very good. Love it. Very cool. Um, interestingly enough, um, I was going to say to you, um, sales scripts, I know we haven't really spoken about sales scripts at all, but are you a big fan of sales scripts? Do they work? Uh, when should they be used? Uh, things like that. And, you know, I, 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 the only reason I ask is because I know that a, a lot of fast growing businesses, they like to try to find ways to systemize and, you know, to, mm -hmm. to, to create training tools or training videos to make their team more efficient, et cetera. But what's your take on, on sales scripts? Do you feel they work? Do you feel there needs to be a time and a place What's your thoughts on that? And what is a good sales script these days? <laughs> <laughs> well, the last one's not a question that can be answered. I th I th that, that. Yeah, I'll give the examples. You know, you may, I don't know, maybe you go on YouTube and you're looking at somebody that's giving a talk or it may have been recently somewhere where, you know, a keynote speaker gave an address. Right. And, and you found it particularly engaging and interesting. Well, the fact is, is that person wrote that script, that speech out word for word and memorized it. And so it's scripted, but didn't feel like it was scripted. Right. Right. So the scripts that people object to when sellers feel scripted is those who are just reading the scripts, right? They haven't memorized it. They haven't practiced it and done it so it's so fluent uh, and fluid in the way presented that it's it seems spontaneous and that's yeah you know, to some degree or another you know if you have 10 years of experience in sales chances are you do certain things the same way you've been doing them for quite a while you know given you may have changed and so on but you're basically following your internal script you know you're doing things you've done before you've said things just the way you've said them before but they become second nature and so the harm, I think, is, is when people complain about sellers being scripted, it's like when it's clearly obvious the person's reading the words and yeah, then yeah, scripted is bad. But it doesn't mean scripts are bad. It's just that people need to learn them. They need to experiment with them again, as I keep saying, and experiment with you, what's going to work for you and your personality and your, your individuality. And you may adapt, adopt it or adapt it, excuse me, but um, you know, you're still sort of following a script. And so again, the problem is not the scripts, it's how they're presented, how they're used. So people need to be given opportunities to practice. You need to give sellers the mandate to memorize it. And it's the difference between, you know, if you want to watch a movie where the actors are acting, having memorized the lines, or if they're standing there in front of the TV camera, <laughs> reading their scripts, it would come off very differently. <laughs> Some good points there. Love it, love it, love it. Now, I know that we're coming towards the end of our, our mm -hmm. interview and stuff, which, but listen, I know that we could be speaking about sales for hours on end, and um, but we don't have hours on end, unfortunately, ladies and gents. Right. But, but listen, I'd love to know what you're working on because I know that you've been working in the er arena of sales for so long. I guess, I, I guess my question that really kind of came to my head is where, where you know, in the next 10 to 15 years from now, mm -hmm. you know, what is it that you want to be known for? What is it? Where is it all leading to? Is there, <laughs> is there something that, that, that is uh, going to be like the big kind of legacy piece for Andy? Um, I'd love to know what your thoughts are about that. Yeah. I think this last book is the legacy piece. Sell without selling out. Um, I wrote it because as a profession, we just haven't been getting better at this job and we're trying to lean into technology to, to to take the place of what we as humans should be doing and at the end of the day people buy from people people make decisions to buy from people based on their experience working with that person as a human being is how do you be more human as a seller how do you create these positive buying experiences for your for your prospects and your buyers and yeah 
I think it's going to become more important as more automation continues as to spill into sales and then to buying. The human piece becomes a greater differentiator, not a less different, lesser different differentiator, excuse me. So the ability to master the sort of core human skills and able to connect with someone to really understand what's important to them and help them get that. Yeah, I think that's alongside what's going to happen with all the let's say, increased use of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and automation. The way you can stand out as a human is going to be the, uh, the key to your success. Love it. Some very good stuff. And, and, and that's beautifully wrapped us up for today. Guys, hope that you've been enjoying uh, myself and Andy's conversations. And I hope that you've got, you've got a ton of notes because I certainly have been writing ferociously with my notebook and pen. And I've definitely got lots and lots of golden nuggets from today. So I hope that you've enjoyed today. Andy, I just want to say thanks so much for being here on the show today. And I really appreciate your time. Adam, thank you for having me on and, and uh, enjoy the rest of your holiday. Very cool. Thank you. And for you guys that are interested in connecting with Andy, please do connect with him on LinkedIn, as he said. Yes. Uh, but also, <laughs> but also what I was going to say is please, or please also uh, check out his book on Amazon. I believe Amazon.com is probably mm -hmm. the best place to go check out his book, Sell Without Selling. Um, and you can look at all the amazing reviews that he's already received. Um, and also when you do reach out to Andy, uh, if you do want to mention, do mention the podcast and they can kind of put two and two together. And I'm sure that in due great. time himself or one of his team will uh, get back to you uh, in due kind. So listen, guys, hope that you have enjoyed today's conversations with me and my myself and Andy. And, uh, and we wish you a great day whenever you are in the world. Take care and we'll see you soon. Cheers now. Hey guys, I just want to say thank you so much for listening to today's episode on the Game Changers Experience. I would be gratefully appreciated if you could leave a good or a bad review, it doesn't matter, one or a five star review, whichever you prefer, on any of the platforms, whether it be on Apple, whether it be on Spotify, Podchaser, etc. And please leave a testimonial or review about our podcast. And if you have enjoyed our podcast, then I look forward to seeing you on the next Game Changers Experience. Take care, see you soon, et cetera. And please leave a testimonial or review about our podcast. And if you have enjoyed our podcast, then I look forward to seeing you on the next Game Changers Experience. Take care, see you soon.